Charles Wesley. Mm. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? He left his Father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace. Emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all immense and free, for, oh, my God, it found out me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine I diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free, but oh, so forth when followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne, and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amen. That thought happened to cross your mind today yet? How does he say it? Adam's sinful race or something like that? That was written by Charles Wesley, who we're going to talk, uh, mention him today in our study. Um, he wrote up to from six to 7,000 hymns. He spoke in the outdoors. He preached to, to at least 10,000 people in one sitting. In one standing, maybe we should say. And uh, there was others that spoke even to larger crowds than that outside, and everybody could hear him, uh, the one that we're going to be talking about. Okay, uh, and can it be? Uh, I want to look, uh, as I've been doing a lot of reading, and if you want to, I don't know if you have time, but if you want to, these are Lester's Magazine, if you want to read about Christian history, and a lot of stuff that's not so much Christian or Christ-like, uh, these are incredible magazines, uh, and they usually focus on w usually one reformer or one along the way. We're up to the, uh, the se early 1700s here today, um, the, the, uh, the age of reason and revival, and as, I'm, as I've been reading these, I realize 
uh, there's a, a real, sh there's a, a sh tremendous shift taking place in the history of the church. Uh, it seems as if God is, and we know that he does, he raises up for unique times, for, and he knows exactly what's needed, and he wants to, in our language, tweak the system, get it moving closer towards what he has purposed, and so he raises up those kind of people for that time. Those are usually very strong personalities, because they have to be, because they're going to be bearing a lot of uh, weight from the enemy uh, of Christ. And so he raises up various ones. Um, but I've noticed it, there's a shift. Okay, there was the, we looked at the, the, the Roman church, the Roman Catholic church, and then it, we, we moved over, Lester talked last week about the, the Anglican church or the Church of England in England. They, see, the power structures of the world were moving from, from Italy and, and Europe to England. England was becoming a very powerful nation. And uh, uh, you've all heard of Henry VIII, <laughs> that fat, lusty, uh, strange man. Um, he was the one actually that kicked the, uh, the Church of England into gear because he didn't want to, uh, he didn't want to submit to the, the Catholic Church, which he was actually a, a Catholic. And so God used even him, that unique fellow, in that. Um, and so as, as I'm going along here, and then it, it shifts, I should keep talking about that, uh, as it shifts from, to, to England, the Church of England, and the, the, they were still hung up on ceremonies and, and all the formalism, and people were not happy with that. Uh, people wanted something more real. And we know that Jesus was an absolutely simple person, when God came to earth, he was not fancy at all. In fact, he said he didn't have a place to lay his head. He, he just used the common everyday people's clothing, etc. He was no, you wouldn't have known that he was who he was from outside uh, seeing him. Um, and so uh, the, the move is always, of course, we're going to talk, we'll do a quick review about the Reformation. That was a movement away from all of that pomp and stuff uh, and the people getting incredibly rich on the whole system. Um, I, I didn't look that verse up, but it came to mind. Who, who think that godliness is a means to uh, wealth. That's in Timothy, I think it is. Uh, he's talking about false, false uh, believers there. And so there's a shift happening. Of course, we know that at that time, the, our own uh, continent here was the, the, the movement from Europe over to North America was happening. And so that shift, as far as Christian history, also is made uh, as the... As the the reformers, not, not so much the re ones that we would call reformers, but the, the Puritans, who we're going to talk about too. Those were the dissenters. Those were the ones that moved away from the Anglican church and who were terribly persecuted for it. Um, so they, they moved to mostly the states. Canada, of course, was a little later. Um, but So there was a tremendous movement. And along with that movement, it would appear that God brought a tremendous revival of Christian spirituality to the people. They, they were a terribly needy people. They were vile. They were wicked. Um, and so that's the, the setting that we're in today. So we're going to be moving back and forth, uh, England or Great Britain, to uh, North America. And so it, the picture is kind of shifting from the, the uh, Italy and, and the, the rest of, of Europe there, because uh, England is off here to the side, an island. Strange how those Englishmen could be so powerful. And yet they were their tremendous kingdom. Um, okay, so I was, I've got to watch my time here. I, what I was really, uh, am, uh, 
it, it keeps coming up to me over and over and over. All this that, that we, even in what's in these magazines, uh, not nearly all of that, I believe, would Jesus put his name to. It's in the name of Christ, it's in the name of church, but Jesus himself, I'm sure, would, would not put his name to it. And he talks about that in, in Matthew uh, 7, and I, I just thought we would take a bit of time to look in the scriptures here and set a uh, precedent. Um, Matthew 7, and you don't need to necessarily call, uh, look at, uh, follow it, but I'll, I'll just quickly read it here. He's talking about false prophets. They'll be like ravenous wolves. And then he says, in verse 21 of 7, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is a life and death situation. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Didn't we do all those church things that you were doing? Uh, Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So that's a chilling, chilling Uh, passage there and then uh, let's go to Matthew 13 and we looked at the parable of the tares Uh, this is also in the same teaching session here it's the parable of the net and this again gives a tremendous illustration of what's uh, what is going to be what is happening right now and what is going to happen so it's always uh, the the past we're looking at the present and then the future as always presented Um, So this is Matthew 13, verse 47. Jesus is is teaching here uh, to his disciples. Uh, He says, once again, here's a new parable. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore or into the boat. I, uh, way back when... um, I was up north, I guess that was the year I met Mary we, with NMTC. We went out with some native fishermen one Sunday morning, I think it was, and they were, they were, they were commercial fishermen, so they were pulling up their nets, and they asked us if we wanted to come with them. So we did. And they, they pulled up those nets, and as they did, I can still see it so plainly, uh, the nets are coming in, the fish, and as they were, as they were coming in, they, would, they wouldn't take them to shore. They would sort them right in the boat there, and the, the good fish, they would throw in their tubs with ice in them, I imagine. And the bad ones, whatever they were, they would chuck them back into the lake. Of course, they were dead. And I, I can still so clearly see it. The pelicans, they knew this whole process. And they would come in, and they would grab those fish that were floating, the dead ones. And, and they would take a, a whole fish, and in that big beak that they have, that's just like a rubber, <laughs> rubber net, they would... They would take it in there, dip it up, and then they would use it like an, a big elastic. They would, they would go like this, and it would just throw that fish right down their uh, head first, down their uh, goriel. What you, Dale, what's a goriel? <laughs> Throat. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so this is exactly what Jesus is talking about here. And, and I remember those guys, they were Christian fellows, they called attention to that, this parable uh, when they were doing that. Um, and uh, it was very interesting. So when it was full, the net, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, and those to be used or sold, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. See, there was the present. He's talking about the future. Um, the angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked his disciples? Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. And so there Jesus gives us that, that picture. And so I, I, I just draw that to a parallel to, to what I, I'm realizing, maybe like never before, that the, the, the work, the kingdom of heaven, the work of Jesus Christ, of 
He's building his church is an utter battlefield. It's, it's strewn with dead and wounded people. And much of what is, has gone on, in, and because the enemy, uh, Christ has said he will build his church, he is doing it and he will do it, but the enemy has said, okay, I'm going to throw as much uh, monkey wrench into the system as I can, and he does in every facet of it, and we know about it ourselves. It, it just never stops. It will stop one day, but not yet. And so uh, not everything, and let's, let's be aware of that. I think we know that. Not everything that says Jesus is of Jesus. Um, and then I thought this would be a great time, uh, talking about the future, uh, just to talk, uh, just to remind us again what is actually coming. Uh, and I could, 1 Thessalonians, uh, where's Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians 4. Here's Paul uh, just giving a beautiful, Timothy, Thessalonians. He's, he's talking about, he's been talking to the Thessalonian believers about the coming of Christ, the last day, the last days, and the coming of the Lord, uh, this Bible says. He says to them, brothers, the Thessalonian Christians, and to us, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, those who die, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and there he is up, up with the Father, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Isn't that unique how he sees it, that they've fallen asleep? Not, not died, they've fallen asleep. Much, a much cleaner, uh, more um, acceptable way of, of putting it. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left, that's us, uh, who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever." Therefore, encourage each other with these words. There the battlefield will be got done. It will be cleaned up. Um, the other day, there was, uh, there's been some tremendous clouds, well, a lot of clouds, but there's one day there there was just incredible clouds, and I, I hope somebody saw it too. There was just an absolutely huge, fluffy, very distinct cloud to the south. And uh, that, it, when I see a cloud like that, I... I think, hmm, could it be? When will it be? It will be, but we don't know when. He will come in like manner as he went. All right, um, let's go to our history lesson here. Uh, we're going to do a quick review just so that we can, because it's been three weeks now since I did that first lesson. Uh, I've been enjoying these lessons so much. I'm <laughs> always disappointed when they're over. Uh, when I'm sitting in the bench, that is. Um, so we looked at, uh, we started about 1517, Martin Luther, he broke away from the Catholic Church. What, what country was he in? The, Germany, right. Is that what you said? Okay, I thought I heard Turkey. <laughs> um, so Germany breaks away from the Roman Catholic Church and the Reformation has begun and that brings in the Protestant uh, season, the, the, the time of, the, of Protestantism. Now, Luther, uh, from what I understand, if, you, if you've got anything to share here uh, if, or that's contrary to what I say here, please do. I definitely am not a... Uh, don't necessarily know what I'm talking about a lot in this history. Lester's much more up, read up about all this stuff, and uh, he would be the one that could give us a lot of this. And, and maybe you too, Alex, have studied this. and um, I have not, but it, it is very, very interesting. Uh, so, but Martin Luther, he did not break free from all, from all of the 
practices of the Catholics. And so, uh, even though he, he never was martyred for his, for his uh, stand, uh, but he, he fell into great disfavor and uh, had a real, he had tussles with the other uh, reformers too. So, and then in 1518, there was the Swiss reformer, uh, Ulrich Zwingli. Uh, he came from, uh, over, where's Germany? Over here, and Switzerland's over here. Um, and so he, he added, and th these guys were somewhat in, I wouldn't say cahoots doesn't sound right, they were, they were along the same lines. They were recognizing what God was saying for their times, that God was, was seeking to pull them back on track again. And then there's, in uh, 1525, Lester talked about this, the Anabaptist movement, uh, it practiced even greater reformation. They were not happy with his, how far the, the original reformers had gone. They wanted to, they wanted to be very much like the, the church in, that we read of in Acts chapter 2, where the church starts. Um, they were, and they were, um, they got into all kinds of funny stuff too, but anyway, and that's where uh, Mano Simons would have been, uh, come out of that. Uh, also the, the Hutterites, there, uh, Jacob Hutter, he was also an Anabaptist. Um, okay, so the Anabaptist, and then 1530, William Tyndale translate the, uh, translates the New Testament into English, so all England can know the Bible, uh, ultimately, um, he, he always said, he, see, the Bible was in Latin and Greek at that time, and the, the, the regular person, the common person, couldn't, couldn't, get, couldn't read that, plus they couldn't get access to a Bible. And so William Tyndale, and he was actually, I believe, a Catholic priest. But he had seen the Reformation movement and he agreed with it, and he realized we've got to get the Bible into people's hands. And he always said so that the, the common plowboy will be able to, will know what is happening uh, in, in relation to what God wants uh, to accomplish. And ultimately, of course, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, he is executed for his service to men, um, William Tyndale. <laughs> He was on the run, and he thought that he, he could trust certain people, and they sent in a, a guy that, to spy him out and that, that had a way of just uh, deceiving William Tyndale, and finally they, they got him to where they wanted him and uh, tied him by the neck and burned him to a stake. So that was William Tyndale. And then 1536, John Calvin. Anybody remember where Calvin, what, what reformer he was? He, he was in Switzerland, but where was he born? France, France right. Very good. How would you say his name, Alex? Okay. <laughs> I didn't read that anywhere. but <laughs> Anyway. So he's the French reformer, another pillar of the Reformation. And he's, the, the Calvinistic teaching is, uh, and I, I was never aware of this so much, uh, but, but reading of the, the uh, especially the um, revival and the, the Great Awakening, the Calvinistic teaching was huge. And <laughs> there was even different, uh, we, we can mess things up so easily, can't we? There was different strains of Calvinism that, that uh, uh, clashed. And <laughs> I remember one, writers saying, you know, I don't know if John Calvin would have put his name to either of those, <laughs> those teachings. And so he is sometimes dubbed with, with teachings that not necessarily is what, is what he uh, was aiming at. So that was uh, John Calvin. Uh, in 1611, oh, how many years ago was that, guys? Quick, do the math. So it's 300 and 389 plus 22, that many years ago, something like that. Um, so the King James Bible is published by King James, I believe, of England, and uh, that was a huge. Uh, there was there was there was other Bibles, English Bibles, but they were in in a, a dialect that were very hard to understand. So they. 
they came up with this King James Bible. I think it was with 50 uh, scholars that, that worked it out. And uh, I think they said that 75% of what Tyndale had translated the New Testament into English is in that King James. Like he was that, that much on that, that they didn't have to change much at all in the... I'm not sure where the Old Testament, what, what time it was translated, um, but they keep mentioning the New Testament, for that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the King James Bible is published. And then, uh, who of you has read Pilgrim's Progress? Okay. You watched the movie? Okay. I think I've read... This is the old English version. If you want to read the Pilgrim's Progress, it is. it was written by who? John Bunyan, who was actually an Anglican priest, and he was a very a strong personality too. Um, he would gladly languish in prison uh, instead of saying, yes, I will not preach. Uh, he said, no, if I get out, if you let me out, I will preach. <laughs> and so he sat there and sat there and sat there. But in prison, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And so this version is in the old German, not German, English. And I have to admit, I read it not that long ago, within the last three years or so, I had to get a version that I could understand because I could not, I couldn't understand what he was uh, saying half the time. There's also a version for kids. I've, I've read that too. And so, but that was written by John uh, Bunyan at this is uh, 1678, so we're in that, uh, what would we call that, the 17th century? I always get mixed up. It, to me, it should be, if it's 1600, it should be the 16th century, but it's always, we're in the 21st century now, aren't we? Yeah, it's always add one kind of thing, just to confuse us, <laughs> simple ones. Um, so John Bunyan writes Pilgrim's Progress in Prison, and this, uh, John, uh, he wrote other books, but that book, it, the Bible is the most printed and read bu uh, uh, book in ever. And Pilgrim's Progress is second on the list. Yeah. So that's interesting. Um, and it's, it's an allegory. It's, you've got to really, uh, if you've experienced some of the things that he's talking about, you understand it much better. Uh, but he's, he experienced things that were just very, very interesting and, and unique to the uh, Christian experience and journey. Okay, um, yeah. The, in our library, we have uh, Pilgrim's Progress on CD. So you okay. can also listen to it. It's up on, in that, uh, on that cart. Okay, good. So there's the old English version, there's the new English version, <laughs> there's the kids version, there's the movie, and there's the... DVDs or whatever, so the CDs, okay. Very good, thank you. All right, end of review, onward and upward. Unless somebody has some questions or wants to say something about that era uh, that we just zoomed through. Um, the, the thought keeps coming back to me too as I'm, you know, we're focusing on the high-end guys or the, the big names. And we'll do that again as we, as we move on. Because um, we don't know who all the little guys were, the, one, the ones that were in, uh, impacted by the Reformation, by the Great Awakening, by those great preachers. <laughs> uh, but there's a, in some ways, unseen to us, there's a movement of our Creator, Savior, to, to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that often is, is kind of almost camouflaged in, in all the hoopla that, that we may be even looking at here. Um, oh, I just had a thought come to me and it just ducked its head. So. Just briefly say, you talk about Calvinism. Can you just say in a couple sentences what did he believe that was okay. different? John Calvin, and this brought him into, <laughs> into uh, not contrast, uh, conflict with some of the other reformers. Um, 
John Calvin, he, he was a, a very gentle, holy man. He had had a, a tremendous experience with Christ in the, the born-again uh, experience. And that's the interesting thing about, I would say the majority, maybe all of these guys that we're looking at, they had, even though they were, they were whether they were from the Roman Catholic Church or from later, a little later from the Anglican Church, they had, there was something inside them that yearned for God. That's, that's the basic thing. And that's what man was created for, was to be one with God. That's what Adam, <laughs> uh, where he dropped the ball. And, and there's, there's just that longing. Who is it that says this? Until that vacuum is filled, uh, there is no fulfillment or meaning to life. But each one of these guys, and, and Calvin also, had had, an, and it was a journey, had come to a point where he met Jesus Christ within, and the Holy Spirit came to dwell within. And so, of course, he would know the, the, uh, the, what the Reformers were teaching, and he became one of the Reformers. But his distinctives, and he, he wrote some tremendous, uh, like he put it down on paper so that it was there to be, to be seen uh, now and down through the ages. Uh, uh, help me out here, Alex. What were the distinctives? There was the, uh, the, the um, when we talk of predestination, that God has elected some to be saved and some, i.e. Pharaoh, uh, not to be saved. That brought him into a lot of, uh, not just debate, but conflict. There was the um, predestination and... Uh, and um, the eternal security. Uh, that, that's what we generally know Calvinism uh, for. Uh, that, that once you are saved, once you've had that experience, you can never fall away from grace. Uh, now, whether he exactly... Uh, if that's what he meant. Um, I'm not sure that that's totally uh, clear. Um, so that was that was one of them. Alex, what were what were some of the other Calvinist teachings? Those are the main ones, like election, and, right? Uh, predestination. There's like five points that you can summarize Calvinism with, but I don't even remember yeah. which ones they are. Oh, I read them too, but I can't remember them. Okay, um, I used to, uh, so being from the Mennonite background, the Mennonites that we were from were not Calvinists. They were the other side. And I don't know if they understood why they were that. or, But that's what I remember about my dad. That's what he knew about Calvinism was uh, as soon as he would pick up, like the, the Daily Bread when we would read that, and he would pick up on something that eternal security, or once saved, always saved, he would say it, uh, that just he would just put on the brakes and uh, <laughs> that that was just reality um, and uh, I hope maybe in later years he understood it further deeper um, the The sad thing is that these these ways these pers perspectives varying varying perspectives they become um, a, a battle field within the battlefield kind of thing, when they, when they never should. Um, and so we have to work our way through that. And, and uh, I, I, I just appreciate so much some of the men that have, have worked through that and can literally say that God is big enough that he can envelope, he, he can embrace both of those uh, distinctives. And uh, so we won't get into that. Um, th is that... Do you know anything else about Calvinism? Okay. John Calvin was an incredibly godly man. And he, he uh, was it him or Zwingli? Either of those reformers. They, they, it, said, it was said of Geneva that it was the most heavenly city because his goal was to see God's holiness in practical outworking in his city. And so uh, one of the, I don't know who it was, but he, he, he visited there and he said he had never seen a, a less godless city than, than Geneva, I think it was. Okay, let's go on. 
Um, you, you've all heard of the Puritans. Okay, now we're, we're, we're making even more of a switch. We're moving, we're, we're in the context of the Anglican Church. Um, the, the main Reformation has started. Uh, I talked to Bunyan. He was an Anglican, and he had to leave the, he was a, what they call a, I believe they called them dissenters. They did not agree with uh, the Anglican Church, how it was, and, and they were just, um, they were brutal at times, and, and they would execute, if you, if you didn't say yes to them, they would execute you, uh, especially the leaders, and, um, and they would change their minds, just whatever <laughs> kind of suited their fancy, uh, and that's why I say it was, it was such a mess, um, and so the Puritans, I have to admit, I, I was still asking Mary yesterday, who were the Puritans? Because that comes up over and over and over. And uh, so I finally I went to the Webster's Dictionary to see what, what is this Puritan thing? And it was literally, and I think I had begun to grasp it, it was literally those dissenters, they did not agree with what the Anglican Church was teaching nor practicing, and so they dissented, and they, they kicked up a stink, and they said, we will leave. John Bunyan, he was an Anglican minister. Actually, a lot of these guys we're going to look at today were Anglican preachers, ordained in the Ang <clears throat> Church of England, but they, they left. Uh, they had their own reformation. And so the Puritans, the, uh, I'll just read what I kind of summed up here. The Anglican Church in England, the Church of England, uh, was, which was a break from the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the Puritans were those who broke from the Anglican Church to live not by ceremony, etc., etc., et but according to the Holy Scriptures. So they had the Bible now, the English Bible. They um, desired to live according to the, the, the Scriptures were the final authority. They were the authority that God had given and the Puritans, uh, in nature, because they, they believed and they were taught that they, were, they had a very distinct place in God's kingdom and a very specific job to do, shining forth Christ, uh, they were, explained, they were incredibly passionate people. They were aggressive people. If they believed something was wrong, they, went against, they, they hammered against it. They did nothing... Uh, gently. <laughs> and, and yet they were also people that loved life. They were actually painted as people with terribly sour and had no fun. They were actually people that, that had great times, very family-oriented. Um, and I'm just covering a very little bit here. Um, and, and what I gleaned from the studying the Puritan movement, they impacted they are still their perspective on on christianity is still impacting us those that have taught us those and they impacted all these men that that we here are going to be looking at in the last 15 20 minutes okay let's uh, unless there's any can somebody add to the puritan thing? they were actually a in, in America, they, many of them came over to uh, the United States. Well, it was, was not the United States at that time. It was the divided states. But they set up, the, the Puritans were very instrumental in getting some of the states going that we now know as the, the states. Um, the pilgrims, remember the Thanksgiving, the American Thanksgiving, uh, the, the uh, Plymouth Brethren, was, was that what they were called? They were from Plymouth, England. Uh, the, they were Puritans. Um, from that, I, I don't want to say sect, from that um, organization or group of, of people. They were moving, actually, uh, they were moving um, society toward much more of a Christianity that we are familiar with, like evangelicalism, uh, the, the simple person uh, having their own experience with God and, and together with the rest of, of the saints, uh, learning, it, 
experiencing the very thing that Jesus said, therefore go and make disciples, uh, baptizing, teaching them, etc., etc. and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Um, the Puritans, they, and, and we won't, probably won't have time to cover that, but they were the ones that impacted those that the, the missionary movement, i.e. The, the Moravians, uh, William Carey, those, those early missionaries uh, that we call missionaries. There was missionaries long before that, but kind of organized uh, missions. Um, all right, let's move on. John and Charles Wesley are the first ones. They were in the early 1700s. So now we're in the age of reason and revival. Uh, this was also, the Puritans were very big. They did not believe in untaught teachers. They wanted their preachers and teachers to be highly educated. They did not want them spouting simplicity or, or simple things. And so they were into higher learning. So they, a lot of the, the big universities or colleges, Harvard, uh, Yale, I believe, uh, what was the other one? Um, not the first one. They, they set up those universities. And so they were very Christian, uh, whereas today they are not a Christian at all, from what I... Uh, was Princeton another one? Anyway, uh, you can check that out too. So they were very much... Uh, they wanted their preachers to be well-educated. So John and Charles Wesley, they were Anglican ministers in England. So that's the... Um, the, the hymn that we were singing, that Charles Wesley, um, these, these guys were <laughs> charged uh, fully. They were, they were men of very strong personality. The, the Wesleys came from a family of 19 kids, and, and their mother is, is uh, their father was an Anglican minister, I believe it was, and so the, the mother was a very godly woman too, and so she saw to it that her kids were taught Christianity. And so uh, for them, that was the Anglican Church. And so John and Charles Wesley, they both were ordained ministers in England, uh, both gloriously born again in uh, 1738, within three days of each other. And they had been, they had traveled with the Anglican Church to America, which they did a number of times. They had traveled there to evangelize, as John Wesley says, evangelize the Indians. And they came back, and John Wesley, at least, he realized, he says, <laughs> it's, it's unique how he, he's, he's in a state of when he should have been so hyped up about what he had been doing, doing God's work, preaching the gospel to the Indians. He came back, and he was totally deflated. And he says, I went to save the Indians, but who will save me? he recognized that he himself had never met God. And so he was in that state for, I don't know how long, but his brother Charles, he also was, was fighting. Uh, of course, we know that when, when, when God is bringing us to that, where we, where we need to be born again, he's, he's got us in his hand, he's pursuing us, but we fight that. The flesh fights it. And so that was happening in the Wesley brothers too. But finally, Charles, the younger brother, he has an encounter with God. And three days later, and they, they were in, uh, oh, Oxford was another university. I think they were at, the Ox at Oxford University where they had what was called the club. <laughs> a young men with spiritual leanings, um, a very elite group. <clears throat> and there they... They, uh, and they were mercilessly taunted because of, of what, they, uh, what they believed, had come to believe. And uh, so they become believers. And I said that already, uh, at least, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, Charles Wesley, he preached to at least 10,000 people at a shot. I mean, that, today that's with our ball, uh, stadiums and that, that's not a big thing. But at that time, an outdoor stadium without any, or an outdoor field or wherever, without sound systems or anything. Um, the, uh, yeah, so he wrote about six to 7,000 Christian hymns. Um, and John Wesley, the, the distinctive about him was he was an incredible, he had a 
tremendous gift for discipling those that had become believers. He, he could not stand seeing people just make a confession and then leave them there. Uh, he had seen what happened when that was done. We see it today when, it's, when that happens. So he set up a very, and, and they were called Methodists for a reason, very methodical, almost, we would, could say, boring. But he set up a system where they discipled those new believers and put them in uh, almost like our care groups and, and, and then into church groups, and they grew just incredibly and there was another uh, contemporary, there was a number of contemporaries, but another one that worked with them. His name was George Whitfield. What does it say about him? George Whitfield, I, I can't get over what these guys looked like. Why, why did they have that fluffy hair, that, those wigs? Or They all had long curls. And, that, that's not really natural. Is that what the ministers did? I, I don't know. I'm glad we don't have to do that. So George Whitfield, he was also uh, at their time, and um, uh, so he was a contemporary of the Wesleys and a very, f- power, very powerful preacher. He preached to 30,000 people in, one, in, in an outdoor field, and they, they said that every person could hear his voice. And he, he was, George Whitfield was incredibly, he had, he had been, before he was a believer, I believe, he had gone to... I don't know what you call it, drama school. He knew theatrics, and he knew how to act, and he used his capacity to act and to uh, impact people in his preaching, and he became incredibly um, effective at preaching the gospel so that people would just flock, just thousands of people would come and and be born again. And... um, so he, he, together with the Wesleys, uh, now they had a terrible falling out, um, kind of like Barnabas and Saul, maybe even worse. See, the, the Wesleys were, were not Calvinists, and George Whitfield was a very strong Calvinist. And they clashed in their, when it came right down to it. Even though they had worked together and preached together, they, they would go to, this, to America together and preach there, uh, and then come back and continue preaching. But Whitfield, I, I read, a, a, I don't know where it was, but I read about Whitfield how incredibly, uh, he did not believe that, that Christians should be fighting or contentious. And so he conceded to the Wesleys, not, not his way of looking at, not, not his Calvinistic teachings, but he, he submitted to them and allowed them to be basically seen as the leaders, the founders of Methodism. So the Methodist Church, there we have one in, in uh, Woboda, that comes from the Wesleys and Whitfield uh, way back. Um, the Wesleys and Whitfield were the founders of the Methodists. Uh, I, I was reading about Whitfield. And these guys, I mean, they didn't know anything about saving themselves. I think the Wesleys, well, John Wesley especially, was more uh, balanced. But Whitfield, he was such an incredibly uh, active man, and not necessarily a well man, but he literally preached himself into the grave. He would just take on, like, he would preach, I believe it was him, he would preach on Sunday mornings, he would preach at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. He would preach all week, probably two sermons a day, and he said the best thing to get him prepared for Sunday preaching was to preach all week. (laughs) By then, I would need a rest. I would need a rest the first day, I think. But um, he absolutely was called to preach. And they said he had a, a, they called it the golden voice of George Whitfield. He had an incredible grasp of the, of the English language. So there's the, the Wesleys and the Whitfield. And Whitfield, um, Whitfield, I remember, he, he, was, he really, he didn't have time to get married. He thought that getting married was just going to be a, uh, in the way for him, but he met this gal, and he, he was actually almost irritated that he was feeling the way he was feeling toward her, and so he writes her from America, or he writes her on, his, on a trip to America that 
Um, he just can't see how marriage would, would help him in any way, because if, if it was going to detract from preaching the gospel, that wasn't for him. But the thing, she had also written a letter, and it got to America before he got there. And so when he comes, the first thing, there's a letter from this gal that he's in love with, and she, of course, is pouring on the coal as far as getting married. She, ha- she, she could hold her own. She could understand. And she, she understood that she needed to stay out of his way. Uh, and, and it said on the, the, the day they got married, uh, he says, I will not preach one sermon less than I have been preaching on the day of my wedding. So he preached two sermons on the day of his wedding. <laughs> Whether they ever had a honeymoon, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's like our neighbor, uh, remember her saying, uh, he, he was a goer, uh, and he was used to getting up very early, and on their wedding uh, honeymoon morning, uh, he said to her, all right, lady, it's six o'clock, get up, we're on the road. <laughs> he wanted to keep moving. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, um... Yeah, sadly, they were uh, uh, dis- they disagreed to the point of separation for some years, but reconciled, and it, it was not a, a it was a nasty uh, disagreement. And uh, like I say, Whitfield was probably the more mature of the three. He backed off, and they were able to be reconciled. I think se- seven years later, and w- uh, John Wesley actually preached John Whitfield's funeral. So that was that was a huge. I'm back there. All right, let's go on to another Puritan, Jonathan Edwards. Um, Lester has talked about him, I believe, already a little bit. Here's another guy. He was born in what we now know as the U.S., but he was also a Puritan from that stock. Um, His father, I believe, was a minister. Jonathan Edwards was from a family of 11 kids. He was, I believe, the last kid, and he was the only boy in that family. Can you imagine having 10 sisters older than you? Um, And he himself, he married uh, Jonathan Edwards when he got to the point of marrying, uh, which was a bit of a challenge too, but um, she was an incredibly high-end person, although her her father was a very well-known minister, and she was an incredible administrator, but they also had 11 children. And so he knew what uh, sibling and sibling r- rivalry was about. Um, so Jonathan Edwards, born in the U.S. in 1703, one boy of 11 kids. He was a contemporary of the Wesleys, although he never met them. But he did meet Whitfield and was a huge uh, follower of Whitfield. Um, a pastor and powerful preacher, an incredible thinker. They say that Jonathan Edwards was probably... America's greatest theologian, and yet a very down-to-earth person. Uh, spoke so quietly that uh, he, they said he was not for huge revival crowds because they wouldn't be able to hear him. But, and he was not passionate in the sense that he beat the pulpit and jumped and everything. Very logical, very methodical, and yet his words carried huge weight. And so he... he uh, also was a preacher of, of revival. In the, uh, God, and God was obviously stirring the world, the new world and, and also where they'd come from, was stirring them into a new, a new thing. Uh, not, not something that hadn't ever been, but, but to bring, bring what had been uh, back uh, as it was supposed to be. Um, a pastor and powerful preacher, an incredible thinker, God used him in revival, the great awakening. Um, and he was also, he was, they called him an evangelical uh, Calvinist. I think my hackamores, there we go. <laughs> you can tell if it was my glasses or my hackamore. Okay, where are we out for time? We're just about out of time. So that was Jonathan Edwards. Um, I did not know how far we would get, but we haven't, we've got kind of got through the main stuff, but I thought I would just introduce for next week. Next week will be our last study. There's a lot of ground to cover. Um, and so pray for me as I, uh, I did a lot of reading this past week, and it, it helped me to begin to understand, enter into 
what has been happening. Um, and hopefully I will be able to this week too. So the, I've got for extras if we ran out of time, but I'll just introduce these. Uh, another, um, another, these, we're getting along into the early 1800s, I believe now. <clears throat> William and Catherine Booth. Who, what, what organization did they begin <clears throat> or put a name to, put their name to? Yes, the Salvation Army. I hadn't realized that the Booths were the kind of people they were. <clears throat> anyway, that's somebody that we'll look at next week. William and Catherine Booth, Salvation Army. Uh, Charles Finney, uh, he was probably the greatest evangelist that, uh, bes besides guys like Billy Graham, but of that time, probably the greatest he, he literally, he, was, uh, he thought a little bit differently. He thought very scientifically. And he had probably come through, I believe, the uh, uh, university college background. And so he put his scientific studies to work on how to bring people to Christ. And he became extremely uh, successful at leading people to the Christ. We were talking this past week about um, evangelism, how we, and I was taught about 3P evangelism way back. Um, presence, you're there, and that's enough, some would say. Proclamation, share the gospel with them, that's enough, they can make their own decision. But the last one of persuasion, where, and Paul talks about that, about persuading the Greeks, the Jews, to turn to Christ. And that's what, what Finney, he was just a master at persuading people to turn to Christ. Although he, well, we'll talk about that later. We need to quit here. Uh, and then the, the great hymn writers, uh, Charles Wesley, we mentioned him, Isaac Watts, tremendous. These men had incredible insight into the doctrines of the Bible. Um, and then uh, John Newton, of course. What, what song did he, that we know of, he wrote other songs? John Newton. Yes, Amazing Grace. And a guy, uh, oh, uh, there is a fountain filled with blood. William Cowper, if you have time this week, look that name up and see what, that was a very strange story. A guy that numerous times tried to do himself in, had had an experience with God, and finally John Newton took him under his wings and, and tried to stabilize him. In the end, I think he actually, but he wrote some of those incredible hymns. William Cowper is his name. And so I guess that's where we should leave it. Let's pray and uh, we can ruminate on that. And Heavenly Father, what an incredible study this is. And we, we love to think of the future and um, to know what's going to happen. Will there be a great revival in our time yet too? Uh, but as we look back, we see, oh God, your hand was in, in this, uh, just um, counseling and moving things along uh, for your glory and your honor and uh, placing the enemies of Christ in their place. And we know that the day is coming when there will be a, a, a much greater yet sorting out of what is the sheep and the goats or the good fish and the bad fish. And so enable us, Father, even this week to be of those good fish that will impact those around us, future generations, our families, towards embracing fully and wholly the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. In Jesus' name, amen.